Hello, my name is Connell Follenkamp. I teach economics and finance at Duke University. Our topic is quantitative methods. Now, before I get into solving problems and actually looking at all the numbers, what I'd like to do is share some, some tips and some rules with you about problem solving to try to make the job easier for you. In my experience as, a, as an instructor for, I guess, over 10 years, I've come across some strategies that, I th that I'd like to share with you and that I think that you'll find helpful as well. I've written them down as a series of tips or rules, if you will, and so I'd like to start by going over those. So let's look at the board that I've prepared and in which I've uh, put down some of these rules. The first rule is to know the formulas. And I've underlined no because it's extremely important. You've got to know them cold. Now, that means that you're going to have to do a lot of memorization. And I realize that's not a fun job, but it's something that has to get done. So to help you do that, I think it's very important to make study aids. Study aids can be things like a formula sheet or flashcards or anything really that helps you remember what the formulas are. If you do that, then that will help you uh, very much in, in when you encounter the problems. Uh, and the act of writing things down and making the study aids actually does help you remember these formulas later on. Now, for people who are particularly nervous about remembering all the formulas, there's a technique that I've recommended to my students that seems to work pretty well. I call it the memory dump technique. In the memory dump technique, the first thing you do in the exam, even before you, you open the booklet and look at the first problem, is you take out a clean sheet of paper and you write down every single formula that you can remember. It doesn't matter if you can't remember all of the formulas at once. What does matter is that you write down everything you can remember uh, right away at the start of the exam. That takes the pressure off you, and then as you remember more formulas, you can go back to the list and add them later, and then you can keep referring back to that sheet throughout the exam. And every time you get stumped, you can go back over to your, to your formula sheet that you've, you've made on the spot inside the exam and, and look it over and see if that can help you solve some of the problems. So in those ways, the, that will help you know the formulas, and that is always the starting point in problem solving. The second rule is know your tools. So let's look at what I've written down under that. Got to know your tools. Well, what are your tools for, for problem solving and quantitative methods? First and foremost, that financial calculator. And by the way, throughout this video, I'll be using the abbreviation CALC for calculator. But you've got to know your particular financial calculator and how to use the important functions on it, because you'll be using it a lot. Uh, so get out that instruction manual, uh, look at uh, other uh, resources like other teaching videos about how to use that financial calculator and really know and understand how to use it so you're comfortable with it. And by the way, if, you, if the batteries in that, in that financial calculator are a little bit stale, either put brand new batteries in before you come to the exam or have batteries with you because in my experience in teaching quantitative based courses, there's always somebody whose batteries run out right before the exam. And that is not a place that you want to be. So please do that. Take care of your tools, I guess, is another thing that we can, we can put that under. The second tool that you're going to be using a lot in quantitative methods are statistical tables. And stati every statistical table is put together slightly differently. So you've got to familiarize yourself with the statistical tables that are going to be provided and know how to use those and how to interpret them. So those are the main tools. Of course, the other tools are just the, the brain tools like the algebra uh, that you're going to have to bring to the table. But know these tools and know how to use them. Another rule that I've written down below knowing your tools is making notes and drawing pictures. In quantitative methods, you're going to be doing a lot of problem solving that are basically word problems. And so if you make notes to yourself to remind you about what's going on and what you're being asked and drawing pictures to help you visualize what's going on, you're going to do a lot better. So as you practice the, uh, the problems and as you follow along in the problems that I'm solving, it would help that if you would uh, take notes to yourself to remind you of things, of facts that you think are important, and to draw little pictures. Uh, these are t techniques that, not, uh, that are not valuable not just for people taking exams, but these are what professionals do on the job all the time as well when they're trying to solve a tricky problem. The goal in applying these rules is to get to the point that I call a plug and chug problem. What does plug and chug mean? Well, let's take a look at the slide and I'll tell you. So our goal is to turn every problem that you're, you encounter from some kind of, of, uh, of a confusing word problem into a straight plug and chug problem. That means that first you recognize what in the world is being asked of you. In other words, you need to ask yourself, which formula does the, does the question refer to? Which formula am I, am I going to need to apply? And sometimes it might be several formulas. The second thing is, which variables in that formula am I being asked to, to calculate or to solve for? 
So the first step, of course, in these, in these problems is always, to do, is always to recognize what is being asked of you, and that means knowing those formulas again and knowing the variables in the formula. So again, you can see how important it is to come into the exam knowing the formulas very, very well. Once you recognize what it's being asked, then you can set it up, and that's the second step. And then once you have it set up, then it's just plug and chug, or in other words, just solving for the variable or variables that are, are uh, remaining to be solved for. So the goal is to take a complicated, confusing problem, to break it down into several steps, turn it into plug and chug, which is always, easy to, always the easiest way to solve a problem. All right, so those are the basic rules for problem solving that, that I want you to be aware of and to keep in mind as you look at the problems that I'm going to be going over. Let me tell you about what I'm going to try to do in this video. Uh, and I, I've got it written down on the sheet, and I'll try to explain the steps. So what we'll do in this video is to pose a problem. And when I pose a problem, I'm going to write out, again, a hairy word problem that uh, looks at first like it is, might be difficult to solve. After that, I'm going to go through the steps that I've just talked about. I'm going to try to recognize that problem, recognize what is being asked, then I'm going to set it up, and then I'm just going to plug and chug my way through it. So hopefully, as you use this video, what you can do is to uh, stop the video after I pose the problem and maybe try to work the problem yourself. Ask yourself, what's being asked of me? What formulas might I need to be using here? And then maybe even try to set it up yourself and plug and chug your way through it. And then you can go and use the video to, to watch me as I plug and chug my way through it and hopefully we both get at the same answer. Now we're going to move on to some even more interesting parts of statistical inference, and that is hypothesis testing. So let me set up a situation and think about some of the hypotheses we can test uh, uh, based, on, based on the situation. So if we look at the board, I'm just setting up a fairly simple uh, situation in which suppose that Firms ROAs in the potato chip industry are normally distributed with variance equal to 0.021. You select a sample of 80 firms and find that the sample mean ROA is 0.1389 or 13.89%. So let me put up the next sheet and finish the problem and, and actually postulate a hypothesis to test. Perhaps you are a seasoned follower of the potato chip industry, so to speak, uh, and you think that the... the uh, return on assets in the potato chip industry really uh, shouldn't be lower, shouldn't be greater than 10%, and, and your number of 13.89 might surprise you. So you could ask yourself, is the population return on assets in the potato chip industry really greater than 10%? So that's a real-world question you want to figure out, and the way that we approach that is to formulate the hypothesis and test it in kind of a statistical sense. So what I'm going to do is set up the hypotheses and you apply the statistical models to try to reach some kind of a conclusion about whether the ROA in this industry really is greater than 10%. Now, if you reflect on the question, you realize that we are given a hypothesis about the mean of the, of the sample or of the population, really, and then we're also given information about the, the underlying distribution. And those, those two uh, aspects are key information for setting up the right kind of test for the hypothesis. So we have a hypothesis about the mean, and we're given information about the normal distribution, and in particular, we know the variance of, of the uh, underlying distribution. And again, that might not be a very realistic situation, but nonetheless, it's one that we can develop a specific test to deal with. So if we go to the board, I've written down the uh, problem recognition line. I say, okay, this is a test of a hypothesis about the mean, only one mean, where the variance of the, uh, the, variance of the population is known. In this situation, that implies that you use the z-test. And, of course, the z-test is based on the normal distribution. Um, it forms the so-called z-statistic. My hypothesis then, uh, my null hypothesis, is that mu is less than or equal to 10%. And there are a couple of reasons why uh, I, I chose this specific hypothesis. Number one is uh, that, I, as I said in the problem, perhaps you, uh, this, this high ROA surprises you somewhat. And so you think maybe your prior belief is that the ROA should be under 10% or 10% or less. The other thing is that uh, the way that hypothesis testing works, and because it's uh, an application of classical statistical theory, which tends to be very conservative in the way that it uh, works with these type 1 and type 2 errors, the only way to really get to support uh, uh, something positively is to show that you can't support kind of the opposite statement. So if you really want to prove that the ROA in the potato chip industry is above 10%, the way that you go about proving it statistically is to show that there is evidence against the idea that it is below 